the Venus Project, the information that is over there. However, I will digress. I came here to talk about participatory economics as a possible alternative for society to move towards. Now, I'm going to give you a little bit of introduction on PARICON, that's participatory economics, and then move into some of the substance of it. Due to the time constraints, I'm going to limit it to how it could function as a business, but think about that extrapolated to a city, to a province, to a state, to the whole world as well. So we probably are all in agreement that there is some sort of economic downturn very serious issues that we're dealing with here. Now, for me, I've been thinking about this a lot, studying a lot, um, doing readings on alternative economic systems, and what has been put forth as PARICON, uh, which has been structured by Michael Albert and Robert Hannell, and there are volumes and volumes of this on the internet. Anyone who's familiar with uh, ZCommunication.com, uh, ZMag, anything like that, you can also go to paricon.org and see everything there for free. Um, so while thinking about this, I came to the conclusion that our political system has become a reflection of our economic system. Now, unfettered capitalism, in my opinion, is going to lead us down one of two roads, some form of, or some form of neo-feudalism, where we become wage slaves, which I'm quite sure many of you can see heading towards that or the much, much scarier version of it, 21st century fascism, which is fairly evident down in the United States right now. You can see that, obviously, anyone who's been follow following any of the uh, Occupy movements, police crackdowns, all these sorts of attacks on personal freedoms and liberties that are supposed to be enshrined, uh, not just in national constitutions, but as human rights. So, our political systems are to become a reflection of our economic system. It makes no sense to use the political system to try to change this. Now, if you take a look at the Security Prosperity Partnership, which is now defunct, going under a different name, which I can't recall, um, any of the G8 summits that occur, or even just the signing of NAFTA, you can see how influential economics has become in guiding our political policies. So that ultimately brought me to the question of, are markets democratic? Do we have any say in what is being produced, how it is being produced, where it is being produced? To some degree we can argue that yes, this is, there is democracy here. We can vote with our dollar, but in a very limited form. Now, one of the biggest things behind this is that democracy involves people getting together. It involves participation, it involves cooperation, respect, listening, talking, and time. Now, unfortunately, we have a counterintuitive economic system which wants to do the opposite of that. We're looking for quarterly gains. We're looking for infinite growth in a finite world, which, I'll paraphrase, is anyone who thinks that is either completely insane or an economist. <laughs> now, we obviously have a system which is looking at greed as some sort of value to strive for, which is incredibly contradictory to basically every fundamental moral value that is held by people all over the world, different cultures, different religions. Morality seems to be a universal human trait. It's a characteristic that we all seem to have and employ from time to time. Now, some people do it more so than others. Some people do it in a very hypocritical way. But that, again, is just a byproduct of the economic system in which we come from. So there's competition instead of cooperation. We have competition for resources. And these aren't just the natural resources in the world. These are human resources. This is us as workers. This is us as consumers. Emerging markets. Um, sorry. Um, different demographics of people. There is entire industries based on studying us and how we react to advertising, the sorts of trends that become fashionable. So we are a resource. That's why there are human resource uh, people who work in office buildings. They recognize that they need to find some way to give us just enough so we feel that we're doing okay. Now, 
So again, to come back to ideas of wage slavery and debt trapping, and again, Ronnie introduced this as well, um, you have to realize that the current economic system that we have basically creates money out of nothing. Thomas Greco has said that it's so simple that the mind is repelled. That literally, the idea of creating a loan, giving it to someone who has not yet produced anything of value to society with the promise that they will, creates a very serious issue. Now, when you compound interest on top of that as well, what you are going to get is, again, from the words of Thomas Greco, um, someone who I believe you should all go and look into, it basically gives us a system that kicks out a steady parade of losers. In order for someone to fulfill their promise economically, someone else has to lose. There's not money created to cover the cost of the interest. Is this democratic? Do we choose this? Do we vote for this? Is this a policy that we can even change in our political system? And if so, how long is that going to take? So this brought me to another question that I've been asking a few people to try to generate ideas. And ultimately it came down to where do we spend the majority of our time? Now, if you're a student, you spend it in school. You can say there is some form of democracy there with students' unions, students' councils, um, if it's a public institution. There's small degrees of democracy there. But for everyone else, and when we get out of that, where do we go? We go to the workforce. And do we have democracy in the place where we spend 8, 10, 12, 14 hours of our day? Now, this is a serious value that we actually hold dear, and we want to live in a country or live in a world that even claims that to be anywhere near true, it doesn't make any sense to not work in a democratic economic environment. So, as people, as workers, as producers, as well as consumers, we need to try to find some way to bring about democracy to the very fundamental level of our lives. Of course, this means doing work, taking the time to do that, and being engaged in it. We can no longer be passive, because that leads us down the fork in the road. And I don't know if you'd rather see you know, feudalism or fascism, but they're both fucking scary to me. I don't want to see either. <laughs> so really, the way to achieve a lot of these, and I think the way in which we can actually influence the greater society around us, is to embody the very values that we claim to hold true as citizens of a country that none of us voted to be part of and do it in our everyday lives, in the system that we choose, producing things that we need, and in the things that we consume as well. So, we've seen in the past, and in our own country here too, the ideas of mixed economies. Well, we haven't really had much success with that. So what about socialism, or what about communism? Um, I personally don't think that there's ever been a true large-scale communist experiment that has happened. Typically what we see coming out of communism and socialism is the creation of a coordinator class. This is a class of people whose job is to plan the economy for us, very much like the people who would do it in a free market. So we still have this very basic idea of classism, which is something that needs to be overcome for democracy to truly flourish and take place. So. That brings us to a Paricon society. Now, so some of the key values, and of course this, is, this has to be very broad. When we talk about communism, or we talk about socialism, we talk about capitalism, we're talking about the key values, the key institutions of how they're supposed to operate. Now, then it comes down to us. The onus is on us as the workers, as the consumers, in that society, in those neighborhoods, in those areas, to actually fulfill that. So from this standpoint, I again would just like to speak about it from a business level to make it a little easier to understand and to let it be something that is actually achievable. There's no point trying to go and spread it across the board and expect everyone to actually get in on this. We need to have models, we need to have people who are doing this to show that it's possible. Well, some of the key values of this, of course, are participation. So this is going to mean that we need to have workers' self-management. No bosses, 
true democracy within the workplace. And this has been done throughout history. There are countless examples of this if you take the time on the internet and libraries. Take a look, it's all over the place. Argentina is a great example of this. Look anywhere down there at the workers' cooperatives that have been going on for the last five or 10 years. Now, another key value of this is the idea of a balanced job complex. I'm gonna to touch on this and come back to it, is the idea that within a workplace, you cannot be so specialized that you can spend your entire work day only doing that one task. We're not machines, and we're highly inefficient when we focus all of our time and energy on one thing for a prolonged period of time. A brain surgeon cannot do brain surgery for eight hours of the day. So what this means is there is obvious downtime that is being wasted on other frivolous things, and especially in a highly connected technological world. It's very easy to go on social networking sites, waste your time on YouTube, entertain yourself while you're at work. Now, of course, with this too, we have a society that creates brain surgeons and janitors. And there's a clear distinction between these people and the type of work that they do and how empowering that work actually is. So the idea of a balanced job complex is to find some way to allow that specialization to occur while at the same time ensuring that these people who are highly specialized doing highly empowering, highly creative, highly influential work still scrub a toilet, wash a floor, you know, volunteer and work outside of their workplace as well. There, there's broader ideas to this that I just cannot get into right now and I will come back. The next thing is the idea of remuneration for effort and sacrifice. Now, our current system has a tendency to just give people payouts for making a lot of money. These people typically do very little within their actual work environment as far as producing something, but it's the fact that they control the people who produce something and they're justly rewarded and we think that this is okay. We also happen to promote the idea of luck and inheritance as something that should be rewarded. Now, like none of us chose to be a citizen of this country, our parents just fucked here and we had no say over it. <laughs> the same thing for those people who are born into power and privilege. They did not work towards that. They have not contributed to be at that level where we see them as someone who should be economically influential for us, nor should they be paid for that. It just doesn't make any sense. If we truly want to have an economic system where you are paid for the work that you do, we need to work to strip that away. Now, of course, what about allocation? What about production? Well, again, participatory economics. The idea being that within a worker-controlled environment, you get together and talk about what needs to be produced, how it's going to be produced for whom you're going to produce it, how you're going to get it out there, and you do it in a democratic way that hopefully will uphold all of these other key values, as well as some other basic fundamental moral guidelines that as human beings we should have the capability to bring out. And of course, well, what about consumption? Same idea, consumers' councils. This isn't anything new. This is an idea that has been around for a long time but it comes down to the idea of communities getting together and talking about, well, what do we need? What do other people in other neighborhoods and communities need? What do people in other states need? Well, let's get together and think about what we need to take. And let's not take more than we need. Let's take just what we need. And if we can sacrifice and live a little bit, or live with a little bit less so that someone else can live with a little bit more, well, that's not really a bad idea. It's actually something quite nice. Of course, then be able to minimize the money that's being spent on missiles and tanks and other sorts of silly machinery that are just obliterating our species day in, day out. No one wants to attack someone who does something nice. I don't walk up to someone, give you a hundred bucks, and expect to get punched in the face. <laughs> I come up and kick you in the nuts, it's gonna be a different story, right? <laughs> Now, one other thing that comes down to all of this as well that I will expand on a little bit um, is that decision-making power is not based on one specific mode. We're not talking about all consensus because there are times where consensus doesn't work. We're not talking about blanket 50% plus one vote every time because that doesn't always work. And of course, we're not talking about the little things that affect individuals 
that the greater society gets to have a say upon. I'll give you an example of this. In my workplace, I decide to take a picture of my dog and bring it to work and put it on my desk. How many people, if we are workers in the same place, how many of you does that affect? That's right, it affects me. That's it. We don't need to vote on this. This is a waste of time, obviously. However, if I decide to bring in a stereo system and start playing Megadeth or Propagandi at the top level, just because I think it makes me work better, I'm sure there are people out there who, you know, even though they're probably the best bands ever, don't appreciate that music. Now, this is where it's going to cause a problem. Do we need to have everyone in the company get together and convene on this? Or do we take those people who are most affected by my decision and hold a vote on this? Now let's extrapolate this to something a little bit larger. Our current system has a tendency to ignore the people who are most affected by economic decisions. Look at the tar sands, the human rights violations that are occurring up there to First Nations people. On contested land that is stolen, how much say do they have over the economic policies and happenings that occur there? Exactly, below zero. That does not make sense. Now, something that I have heard that I've taken quite personally is that what is keeping it from happening to me? Now, I think if you actually think about that, you would want to have some sort of say if you hold a stake in that, be it in property taxes, be it in tar sands developments, be it in deforestation, you know, be it in gentrification. These are issues that we have to face as human beings. Now, we have a system that just glosses that over. The people who have the power to make the decisions that are affecting hundreds, thousands, millions of people every day, they're left out. Those people who are the victims have no say. So we need to create a system where they have the power to contest an economic policy. And that you will meet and you'll either come to a concession or the vote says no. We don't want it. We don't need it. Go somewhere else. And our society would be able to respect that decision. So I'd just like to come back to the idea of workers' self-management again. Now I talked about consensus and talked about majority voting. These are things that we need to use in concert with each other. Because again, they don't work 100% of the time. Of course, this also means that there are not bosses. So we need to get together, we need to talk about things. If we need to move between departments, we're going to elect councils and basically come up and create some method of rotation that will properly reflect our own personal views as workers within the workplace. Very much like we have a parliamentary democracy in our country here, there's presidential democracy in other countries, different systems work in different situations. And this is what needs to be recognized. Human beings are diverse in themselves, in cultural traits, religious traits, language, uh, physical attributes. So why not in the formulation of, of our democracies? As long as democracy prevails, it doesn't matter how it is achieved. And that is what needs to be looked towards for workers' self-management. It will vary in this business, it will vary in this business, to whatever needs they have. There's no blanket answer for this, and that's what I want to get across. Now, the idea, of course, of balanced job complexes is, is within a workplace, you should be able to have a schedule that you can yourself vote on and be able to do work that you find empowering, but at the same time do rote menial tasks so that we don't create a hierarchy of basically skill power. We don't want that. We want more equality. We want more justice. You know, and those aren't bad values to try to get. Of course, this would also mean that if we work in a very good environment, where we're not exposed to dangerous chemicals, we're not exposed to um, any sort of hard, physically straining work. It's expected that we will also go and work in another work environment so that overall, we have roughly the same job complex as someone else. So that means we might have to go and spend a day driving a truck. That means we might have to go spend every Thursday and Saturday afternoons working with children. It makes us better people. It gives us a better sense of community. 
and ultimately it helps out with the other participatory planning concepts within this because you know people you know the needs of other groups that you will end up representing if you're elected or that someone will end up representing if you're elected it's a way of building community and strengthening people not strengthening individualism not strengthening antisocial behavior because that's what we have now and it's obviously not working um, of course, we can extrapolate beyond that and move to spokes councils on much larger levels. And it all ties back in together. Now, I didn't prepare enough to be able to go in depth with all of that, so I hope that what I've presented you with is enough for you to have an understanding of what it takes to build a community, what it would take to build a Paricon business at the very least. Or at least a Paricon organization that works towards that sort of thing. Um, of course, if you require any additional information on this, paricon.org, just go and search Michael Albert, go and search Robert Hannell, or Robin Hannell, sorry, and uh, Z Communications and ZMag. Great, great, great resources for all of this, volumes and volumes. Um, I do know that there's a Vancouver Participatory Committee, or Participatory Economics Committee, um, I've tried to get in touch with Mondragon Cafe in Winnipeg and uh, G7 Welcoming Committee out of Winnipeg as well for a more down-to-earth, actual, practical approach to this. However, I've heard back some from one that didn't give me very much and nothing from the other. So I wish I had more to present to you tonight, but I hope that that was a nice, uh, tasty little piece of brain food for you. Thank you.